this is me, Edward Bouchel. I live in Winnipeg. Luckily, it's not minus 40 degrees yet, but it is getting there. Next week, we're down to minus 20. So this is uh, what I do for fun. I do DIP flap surgeries and multiple other free flaps. Um, I've been doing it since 2000. 99 um, and since then I've done about 3,000 DIPs and about 2,000 other cases um, and I would like to make this go forward there we are so the first time I saw Dr. Ramakrishnan's talk I was I had never seen him speak before and I was speaking right after him as I'm doing now and each time I watch him talk, I am amazed by two things. One, the clarity of the what he explains, how, how he gets efficiency. And two, how similar all our processes have become. And that, I think, leads credence to our talks. That two people who have independently come to a similar conclusion, um, we have done that without talking to each other. We have done that through trial and error, through working through process mapping. And, and this is where we're gonna have a lot of similarities in my talk. I'm gonna try and briefly go over my talk when there are similarities and move on to other things that are slightly different. But how do we increase efficiency while maintaining efficacy? That's the most important thing. We just don't wanna be fast. We need to be fast and good. So we've standardized everything. This is Dr. Uh, Ramakrishnan's talk. Um, the synchronous thing is not doing a sequential, but doing them in parallel. We also talk very much about eliminating steps. I live in a very heavily unionized environment as many people in organized health systems do. Um, it's very difficult for me to get an operative team of nurses to run a faster race. Our goal is never to run a faster race. Our goal is to run a shorter race. I want to eliminate all of my steps. So I'm not gonna get people to work harder. I'm gonna get them to work more efficiently by eliminating steps that are completely redundant or can be done in parallel. And then this reevaluation process. You're gonna go back later on, you're gonna take videos of what you've done and you're gonna look at them exactly like expensive sports teams do. Your F1 racing team will do the exact same thing. We will do this over and over again to try and figure out, okay, where do I stand? How many people come in and out of the room? Can I do anesthetics differently? What do we, what are we not prepared for? So reevaluation is very important. What does efficiency give us? Well, it gives us more cases. It gives us less effort. It gives us less complications. We make more money if you're in a privately funded system to any degree and there is a better work-life balance. I guarantee you that somebody that is taking a long time to do a microanastomosis or to do an elevation of a DIP flap, regardless of how much time we give them to do it in, is not doing four in a row. The amount of effort, and this is no um, disrespect or, or belittling what Dr. Ramakrishnan does, but the amount of effort that he has putting in to do four cases in a row is a tenth of what somebody who is starting out is putting in because he's gone through this process. He's narrowed down everything that he doesn't need to do. That is part of your work-life balance. You need to work to get to that so you can do other things. At the start, we learn when we're starting step by step tech just completing the surgery. I have to get this thing to survive. But in general, we rely on everybody else in the room. We rely on our nurses, we rely on our administrators, we rely, we rely on anesthesia, and we just focus on the surgery. That is a problem because everything else has a significant impact on how quickly you do your surgery and how reproducible that surgical outcome is. This ends up hurting us if all we do is we focus on our part. Our part should be everything. Many non-operative steps are as important. We shouldn't ignore them. So when I say we, you, you as a surgeon need to control everything. Yes, you need to control everything. You don't need to do everything, but you need to control everything. And everything should be standardized. I don't wanna designate doing anything that I should be doing. And again, control doesn't mean do. 
It just means you understand so that you're able to coordinate and integrate that process with everybody else in the group. There are many places where you can do one case a day. In most socialized healthcare systems, you cannot just do one microsurgery case in a day. It is not sustainable from a financial standpoint. It is not sustainable from an operating room resource standpoint. And it's for sure not sustainable from a population-based standpoint. If you can get a breast reconstruction done and they can do three or four breast implants in a day, regardless of the cost of those implants from a population-based standpoint, your group, your hospital, your regional authority, your, health, your socialized healthcare system will tell you, don't do the free flap. If you can do four of something versus one of these with the same operative time, you will be told not to do it. So we have to be able to become very efficient doing this. How do we do this? This is, this is the exact same thing in different words that you just heard from Dr. Ramakrishnan. So chronologically broken down and process engineered. We started this I don't know, a long time ago. And I modeled it after a cardiac surgery group that went through this probably in the mid to, well, late 80s, early 90s, where they standardized everything in cardiac surgery. And I used that as the model. So I went chronologically and I went pre-op. So prior to even getting in the OR, we looked at from the car to the car, every process, every step, do they get lost along the way? Do they get lost in nuclear medicine, getting their injections? Where are they? We process engineered every step. The big things are prior to getting into the OR, the setup for our nursing and our PAs and anesthesia. This is before we start to operate, we looked at that group and then interop. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time going through operative techniques and the choices. Um, because it, it augments what has already been said. We found that we preoperative mark before they get into the operating room. So we see these people in their pre-op holding area. There's a set time that I walk down with our residents and our fellows. This is teaching time for me, but it's teaching time because I'm also doing stuff, something very productive for the patient. So we preoperatively mark, so we verify all of our locations. We go over the procedure and the consent with the patient. So the patient and the nurses, are on the same page. There's never any question that a nurse has to call me and delay the start of an operation or find a resident to say, okay, what side are we doing? Are we doing a nipple sparing? Are we not doing? Are we doing a sentinel lymph node? Are we, everybody is on the same page and we start that right at the start. Once we're in the operating room, it's the same setup, meaning nursing and anesthesia. Anesthesia, we sat with and said, okay, what are we doing? We use an endotracheal intubation. We use per the same setup every time. It doesn't matter um, how great or how extensive your, your setup is as long as it's completely standardized. And we found that is very efficient because my anesthetist changes out every day. I never have the same anesthetist. So I want them to just look at a cookbook and say, my routine patient gets this type of anesthetic. It is set up for them. They go to sleep. They go to sleep in 10 minutes. Our PA or our physician assistant coordinates everything. My residents change, my nurses change, my anesthesia change. The stability is my physician assistant. They make sure that everybody is on the same page, following the same path that has been followed many times in the past. And the last thing is this parallel thing, this parallel operations, this closing and micro at the same time extends to my preoperative period. So anesthesia doesn't get the right to say, okay, I'm intubating the patient. Nobody can touch the patient. No. Prep is going on. Arms are being positioned. The patient is being intubated. Foley catheters are going in. SCDs or sequential compression devices are going on. All this is being done by a specific designed member of the team in parallel. Our setup standardization is very important, not only for us, but also for nursing. Most of, these play, most of these big procedures are done in teaching institutions. That means the nurses have to learn and have to teach what you want to do. A standardized setup is easy for them to teach. They can learn the same thing. The smaller you make it, the less they have to learn. It is great for them to teach off of that. 
So we have a set prep, we have a set draping. All our sutures are pulled at the start of the case for a routine case. All our equipment is opened and our routine disposables are opened. We have something called a disposable pack. It looks like a giant Christmas present. It has 85 to 90% of everything we need for that case in one pack. I can set up a tape back on the back table in 10 minutes by myself because I open up the pack and everything sits right in front of me. I spread it out nicely on the table. It's set up the same way for every nurse every time. This is before it goes into a pack, but everything you see on this table is everything for our mastectomy and for our reconstruction, excluding the microscope. All of our sutures have now been combined to from that cart to being in our pack. We do this for all the surgeons. Every surgeon doing microsurgery in our institution is done the exact same way. Now that's a major problem for plastic surgeons because we all know we're very special and we're very unique and each one is better than the other person. But that's really not true. And for me, the biggest aha was about five or six or seven years ago when I sat after Dr. Ramakrishnan looked at his slides and went, we're saying the exact same thing. And we live 4,000 miles away from each other and I've never seen him before. So we are all very, very similar. And we can standardize for most of these operations right across the world. We can do this. And when we do this, we can get our equipment minimized to fit on one operative table. That decreases clutter, that increases our ability to teach because there's less to teach and markedly increases our efficiency in the operating room. That's our entire setup for our microsurgery. That's, that is all you get. If you can't do our cases, any perforator flap from anywhere in the body with that setup, don't do it. We'll show you how. Anesthesia, I talked about already. They have a standardized induction. We have agreed to slightly over monitoring compared to other people. So we still put in art lines. That's because I couldn't get unanimous approval from all anesthetists. So I went to a common denominator where every anesthetist agreed that this is what the minimum anesthesia they would be comfortable with. And that's what we set as our mark. So we over, I believe we over monitor with art lines when we don't actually need them, but it is standardized. It is the same and it is quick. So the operation, I wanted a team up to now. I have this huge team involved with me and I still have a team around me doing a mastectomy and helping me close. But actually when I'm elevating the flap and when I'm doing the micro, I, I personally really don't want a team here. I want to be able to set up things so I can hold my head in one position and have instruments passed to the palm of my hand and I never have to take my eyes away until that flap is up and placed on the back table. And then when I put it in the chest, when I start the micro to when I'm done the micro, those two big processes, I don't want a team. And I'll show you why I think that improves your efficiency dramatically. So if you do that, it makes everybody in the room easier with this operation. This operation becomes like any other operation that a nurse is doing, whether it's a hernia repair or whatever. Everybody then wants to be part of it. It's not a big operation that is, you know, you're gonna need 12 hours to do. So it's a snowball effect. The nurses, anesthesia, and all the techs in the room suddenly wanna be part of your operation because it's actually easier for them. When we looked at our, our operative technique, we best practice standardized everything. That was a concept that we did all surgeons in our entire hospital. We have about a thousand bed hospital. Um, and myself and my partner were the ones to start this. And we standardized everything, nothing changed for us. We then had every step having a near reliable backup. It's a backup for our cases. And that's the reason for a backup for us is we use monopolar cotter for everything. We do not have bipolar cauteries on. We use very few clips. We don't use preoperative imaging and we have no exclusion criteria for, for doing tissue off the abdomen. The next big important thing for operative technique is limiting the need for help. And that's talking about my team. I use monopolar cautery exclusively. Our flap choice that we use, SIA, DIP, 
versus other parts of the body are based on this ability to have a reliable backup, the need for help and monopolar cautery. And we've now gone to, on all of our cases, what's considered, I guess, a very short or ultra short pedicle. Our pedicles are approximately five centimeters in length at max off the DIAP. I believe it is time saving, but I also believe it's a morbidity benefit to the patient. We do synchronous operations the entire case. There is never two or three, there's never not two or three surgical teams operating simultaneously on these patients. So the concept of a near equivalent backup that's reliable is very important. When you're starting, it allows for a rapid dissection of your perforator, finding your perforator without a potential catastrophic loss. When I'm teaching, everybody's like, oh, you cannot go that fast. You can't pull that hard on the flap. You can't come that close with the cautery. Why are you going so fast? Well, the ability to do that and your anxiety level and the ability of your fingers to work slowly happens when you're not so anxious. If you knew you had a secondary option that maybe wasn't perfect, but would result in you not harvesting a hunk of fat, then your fingers are better they're smoother, your anxiety level goes down, and I think you have a better, more efficient way of harvesting these perforators. I'm going to show you how I do it right away with a short video. I agree that when we do things very, very fast, we can damage some of the perforators, and that is where this reliable backup is so important. So my order of flap dissection becomes an SIA, then a DIP in every case. I harvest or look for a medial vein and a laterally placed SIA or SCIA vessels in every case. Once I know they're there, I may not dissect them any more than you saw with Dr. Ramakrishnan. I may only dissect them three, four, five centimeters, but I know they're there. I know they perfuse into the flap. After that, my perforator choice, I always start contralateral, to the breast team, as was told to you before. My perforator choice is almost always periumbilical and eccentrically placed on the flap. The reason for that is I believe an eccentrically placed flap or perforator on the flap can be very, very short and still go to either an IMA perforator or to the internal mammary vessels because I don't need enough, I don't need very much length to, transver to traverse from the center of the flap to the edge of the mastectomy footprint. My donor vessels are, as discussed before, perforator and then the IMA and IMV. The IMV dissection is always inferior to superior from the fourth ribs. So I take fourth or fifth rib and I'm going more and more and more to the fifth rib because it's better positioned for short pedicles because the vessels are smaller. I have two veins in most cases. And now I'm doing much more nipple sparing mastectomies. So I need to go, when I do a nipple sparing, I go inframammary fold. And therefore at the inframammary fold, I need to go as low down as the chest as possible. The next thing I talked about was limiting help. So I use fish hooks or self-retaining elastic retractors because they provide a dynamic retraction. They continuously pull the, pull the tissue apart while I continue to dissect for me. They don't look at what I'm doing. They're not trying to learn from what I'm doing. If I have a learner and they're watching, they can watch over my shoulder, but they don't need to retract. It allows me to position myself perfectly so that I don't have anybody else around me. They can just watch over my shoulder if they're watching. And if they're doing it, they learn to do it themselves. We've changed our technique in our SIA exposure and the length of our DIP pedicles, and I'll show you the videos of those. And our microsurgical technique has changed. We use a coupler clamps and we intubate because I do the micro by myself and we teach our fellows to do micro by themselves without an assistant. The next concept is the monopolar cautery in the operating room and the harvest of this. I use the monopolar for everything. People were worried that you would damage um, your veins, you would damage the perforators, you don't. There, we have good histologic studies to show that there's almost no damage to the intima of either the veins or the arteries with monopolar cautery set on 40, 40 for the perforator dissection, dissection and 60, 60 and 80, 80 blend for coag and cut for everything else that we do. I believe there's a better visualization of planes. A Teflon coated cautery tip 
is a great way to bluntly dissect. We're able to cauterize most of the side branches without clipping hardly any of them. <coughs> Sorry. There's no clips. So moving of gauze never, never snags on any of the clips to pull them off or cause damage to our vessels. It is quicker because I have a forcept in one hand and the cautery on the other and I ask for nothing until I hit a perforator that I can't coagulate. So I have less interaction with the scrub nurse, less reason for me to lift my head up, less reason for me to ask for something, and I'm not exchanging instruments over and over again. I'm gonna give you a short video of just how I do the DIP and how short the pedicle is and why I think it's, why I think it's important. On every case, we start with our lateral and superior incisions. And once we have the lateral and superior incisions done, we're gonna head down to the SIEA. We will find the medial vein in our fat. And you can see that most of my retraction is done with my left hand until I get down and I see the vein. We'll then find the medial vein and the laterally placed SIEA or SIEV. We dissect it out for three to four centimeters in length. And what you're gonna see here is that we're actually doing bilateral flaps on this patient and the resident gets to do it on the other side while I'm doing it on the contralateral side to the mastectomy. And there we go. Once that is done, we start from lateral to medial we lift off, but with monopolar cautery, it's your left hand that's doing the dissection. And if you look in this area right here, you need to pull up enough on the flap so that you're in a loose areolar plane. And then the cautery can be set at 40-40 or 60-60 until you hit the lateral row of the rectus abdominis muscle. So we will continue to go down all the way until we hit the lateral row of the rectus abdominis muscle. As soon as we do that, we will try and find one perforator and that becomes my backup. So I'm gonna find this one perforator out here, again with cautery. If I'm in a loose areolar plane, I'm gonna use cut. And if I see little blood vessels, I'm gonna use coag. After I found a lateral row perforator, then I go superiorly and in periumbilical region. We will undermine on the upper abdominal skin. Remember, I have no imaging. So I will undermine, find out where my perforator is, and then dissect the skin flaps off. What I'm doing here is just going a little bit further laterally to find a reliable backup because I didn't see anything in the periumbilical region. After I've done that, we'll cut out the umbilicus, and now I'm gonna go after the flap or the perforator that I think I'm gonna use, which will be in the periumbilical area in most cases. I choose to take a medial row eccentrically placed. What I'm doing now is undermining the superior skin so I can flip it out of the way, but as importantly, I'm looking for where those perforators come through. Again, the left hand, lots of traction until I see that loose areolar plane developing, and then there is nothing else in my hand besides the cautery. I'm using the cautery to bluntly dissect the loose areolar tissue, until I find a single perforator. And you can see it between my index and my long finger when I get my cautery out of the way. So there is one perforator in that region. I have a good perforator. And what you don't see is I have my SIA still down there. So my SIA has become my backup now. All other perforators go. And my large perforator that sits in the periumbilical area, I now get to focus on. So you can see the perforator at the superior edge of this flap. Once I've done that, I incise the fascia. The patient is completely paralyzed at this point because the monopolar cautery will jump. It will cause the muscle to jump more. Significant retraction on the fascia. Cauterize anything that bleeds. And then I will use the same pulling technique on the muscle. I pull superior and inferiorly around the perforator on the muscle and then split the muscle until the perforator goes down to below the muscle level. I go around the back of the perforator by only cutting on each sides of the perforator, the muscle fibers that are attached to it. 
I never actually look at the undersurface. And you can see right away that as soon as I cut that, I can slide underneath now the backside. And I've never looked at the other side. And I've completely circumscribed this perforator. My fish hooks, which you just saw going in, are now giving me dynamic retraction. I then will carefully pull the flap away so it pulls the perforator and gently coag the attachments or the small little perforators that come into the muscle. How far do I go? I go enough so I see the undersurface of the muscle and I have approximately five centimeters in length. I want to take the vessels so that they actually go to the deep to the undersurface of the muscle because I believe the thickness of the vessel is better at that point. That's the length of my typical incision. This is five centimeters in length on stretch and that's all I take in most cases. So the short pedicle technique is dependent upon a series of things. Eccentrically placed perforator, so I don't have to run the perforator from the middle of the flap to the edge of the flap. Verif verification of perfusion, especially if you're going to the contralateral side or if you need a large volume of that flap because it may not perfuse as well. So we do use ICG imaging if I'm questioning it at all. I dissect below the rectus abdominis muscle because I believe the adventitia and the thickness of the vessel walls increase when you go below the muscle level. The IMA dissection is the fourth or fifth rib if an inframammary approach is used. If I'm using an IMA dissection, as in this case, I will take a long segment of the IMA. And the reason is, while I'm shortening my, inter my DIEP pedicle, I will try and increase the length of my internal mammary vessels so I can take those vessels and put those vessels on gauze. So my flap on the left-hand side, you can see folded with a nice little short pedicle coming out down onto the white gauze. And then my internal mammaries are now piled up on top of that gauze and brought out above the level of the ribs. So I'm now suturing one to two centimeters above the level of the pec muscle because I've taken a long internal mammary here, put it on gauze, put it on a background, and I can take a short pedicle from my DIEP and hook it up to my internal mammary vessels, and I'm suturing flat, not in a hole. So the eccentrically placed perforator is very important because I cannot move this flap around. I have already defined my pocket with stitches. I have already done any shaping if I think I need it. And I have already deepithelialized my flap where I think my skin pedicles need to be. In general, when we only focus on this surgery, we will lose control of everything. And I encourage all surgeons when they're starting to try and control, understand, appreciate what everybody's part in this team is. We are not unique. We are incredibly, incredibly efficient. And group practices, standardization, not just for yourself, but for everybody else in your hospital is vitally important. The nurses learn quicker. Anesthesia learns quicker. Everybody buys into this quicker. So I do two cases in an eight hour day, sometimes a bilateral in the morning and a unilateral in the afternoon. I do 300 micro cases per year. I teach residents on every single case. I have some time for research. I have some time for administration. Our failure rate is not 1.5% anymore. Um, our failure rate sits at about 0.8%. And as long as you're around 1%, that's pretty reasonable. It does depend on your selection, on who you're selecting, if you're taking everybody or not. Our take back rate is way less than 5%. And our highest take back rate happens in our neoadjuvant chemotherapy patients. The best indicator I can give you is when your hospital goes, oh yeah, you're just adding on another free flap and they allow you to add it on at the end of the day as an extra case. Thanks.